into Gita from Zero, session number 29. We're getting way up there. And today we are going to do chapter 2, part 5. So uh, this is uh, from 231 to 238. And uh, these are some of the things that we'll touch on, we'll recap uh, subsection 2. We're now going to be in subsection 3 today, and we're going to hear about uh, Arjuna's duty, Krishna's social arguments, Sanskrit wor- words in context. Um, this is uh, what the future will hold. I uh, now moved us up into a whole different section. So today is 6-14, the 14th of June. And uh, we're in chapter 2. This is, you know, number 5. And um, we are going to really be working with uh, uh, subsection 3 today, which is a subsection I call um, our, uh, Krishna's social arguments. So uh, we'll be talking about that in a minute. So we're going to talk about Arjuna's uh our enjoyment our argument and how Krishna contravenes it, social argument, uh, Sanskrit words used in different contexts. So that's today. Next week, we're going to move into the Buddha Yoga section of Bhagavad Gita chapter 2, which is subsection 4. So we're going to do an entire subsection today because it's a relatively short one. And uh, usually... If the subsections are really long, I have to dry, break them up into smaller pieces. Okay, and then uh, on uh, the 28th of June, we'll be doing um, um, subsection 4, but we'll go a little further into it. We're going to have to do subsection 4. It'll take uh, three weeks to get through it because it's got a lot of uh, verses. It goes all the way from 39 to 53. So there's a lot of verses there, so we have to break that one up into three pieces. And there we'll learn about Buddha Yoga, which is basically just another name for Bhakti Yoga. But um, that's what uh, subsection 4 is all about. And then subsection 5 is this section here where we'll learn about um, the four questions that Arjuna asks and what a stita di muni is, or a very advanced person. So that's what section five is. At any rate, that's how the future looks. And again, focusing on the present. Today is session 29. We're going to be doing text 31 through 38. And this is subsection three, social arguments, 31 through 38. And <clears throat> we're going to recap subsection 2, since we're starting subsection 3. So I wanted to do that. We'll do that quickly, and then we'll get on with Arjuna's duty, Krishna's social arguments, and some Sanskrit words in context here. Uh, so this is kind of what we hope to work through today. It's a very nice view from here now. Now we see it was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you can see it better. So, first thing I wanted to do, I always try to keep where we are in Bhagavad Gita in focus because uh, Bhagavad Gita is big. And so we have 18 chapters. We're in chapter 2. We're in just beginning Bhagavad Gita. And chapter 2 is, as I've said before, a. Uh, big chapter, it's a double chapter basically because it's a summary chapter both 2 and 18 are summary summary chapters and they're both very big chapters they have almost twice the amount of verses that most other chapters do so these are the five sections we just talked about them so we've already been in chapter 2 through the first subsection Arjuna's further doubts and his surrender which was 1 to 9 Uh, There, you know, um, Sanjaya prefaced it, and then Krishna speaks a couple of verses, you know, chastising Arjuna for his so-called compassion and wanting not to fight. And then Arjuna finishes up his doubts and says he wants to surrender to Krishna, but he's not going to fight. So that's in 1 to 9. We did that a couple of weeks ago, actually several weeks ago. And then 
we went into this long section which has 21 verses in it from 10 to 30. Krishna replies explaining the body, soul, and reality. So this is what I sometimes call the not the body section because mm -hmm. Krishna explains this is the body, this is the soul. Mm -hmm. The soul is like this, the body is like this. The soul lasts forever, the body is destined to die. So why are you uh, making all this argument about uh, killing your relatives because they will exist forever anyway. The soul will exist. So we've uh, heard Krishna explain how the soul is eternal, it's un invisible, it's amazing, etc., etc. And that was two. That's what we finished last week. And so today we're going to do the entirety of this subsection, Krishna's further arguments explaining the duty of Nakshatri from 31 to 38. And then next week we'll start with section, subsection 4, Buddha Yoga, which is 39 to 53. And then later on, beginning into July, we'll get into um, Krishna Speaks on Transcendentalists answering Arjuna's uh, four questions. So Arjuna starts the... Um, Stita D, or the Transcendentalist section, which mm -hmm. starts at 54, by asking four questions, and Krishna elaborates on those questions. So that ends up chapter 2. So this is where we are in chapter 2. We're in Bhagavad Gita, 18 chapters. Now we're in chapter 2. Now we're breaking down chapter 2 into parts, and now we're in the third subsection of chapter 2. So um, this is a recap we're, we're actually, we're starting section, subsection three of chapter two. So we're going to recap subsection two, which is what we did last week. So these are the various verses that um, uh, Krishna explained in Not This Body. <coughs> so in 10, Krishna speaks to Arjuna, and then... Um, Krishna tells Arjuna, he's speaking these learned words, but people who are actually wise don't lament. And he explains that never did we not exist, not only Arjuna and Krishna, but even all these kings that are on the battlefield. So never did we not exist. So everyone is eternal, not just God, but everyone is eternal. And not just in the past, I mean, not just in the future we're eternal, but we're also uh, eternal in the past. So then... 13 is a very famous verse, body changes even within one lifetime. So as the soul has a little body, then a bigger body, then finally an older body. So we're already changing bodies, and it's not a surprise then or not a stretch of the imagination to think that the end of this body will change into another completely different body. So happiness and distress have to be tolerated is 14. Um, Arjuna has to fight his relatives, and this is a type of distress. And so Krishna is saying that <clears throat> winter and summer are there. In summer we feel happy and it's warm, and in winter we feel miserable and it's freezing. Uh, and we have to tolerate both happiness and distress because the most important thing is duty. So Krishna is making a point of that here. And then those people who are steady, especially in happiness, distress, can be liberated. There's a difference between sat and asat. So sat means uh, permanent and asat means temporary. And in this case, we're positioning the soul as sat. It is eternal. And the body is asat. It's temporary. So no one can destroy the soul, but the material body is easy to destroy. And it's always going to be destroyed in some fashion or another through the course of time. And so Arjuna should fight. This is how Krishna is starting with basic philosophy that the body is temporary, the soul is permanent, and that uh, Arjuna cannot slay the soul, so he doesn't have to worry about this idea of getting sin by killing his relatives. So Krishna goes on to say more. Soul slays not nor is slain. The soul exists eternally, past, present, future. The soul is eternal, indestructible, unborn, immutable. This is the way Krishna describes the soul. So the soul has all these amazing properties. The body does not have these properties, but the soul does. And then the body is like a garment in 22, you know, Vishanti Jirnani Yata Vihaya. So the body 
is like a dress or an outfit that we put on in the morning. And when a set of clothes gets too old, we throw it away and put on a new one. Similarly, when the soul has been in a body for a long period of time, then the soul is forced out of the body and it accepts another body just like a person puts on clothing. And the soul can't be cut, burned, drowned, or withered. The soul is everlasting, everywhere, unchangeable, immovable. The soul is invisible, inconceivable, immutable. So there's no need of grief. So we see Krishna is talking about the soul, the soul, the soul, the soul, the soul. And then he peppers in a little bit of things about the body, showing how the two are different. And then um, Krishna tells in 26, even if the soul does perish... Uh, if you believe that, Krishna doesn't believe that, it's not what the Vedas say, but he says even if you do believe that, still there's no need of grief because it's going to happen anyway sometime or another. And uh, so there's no need for worry. And then birth and death are certain, therefore there's no need for lamentation. So for the body changing, that will come to every human being at some time or another. And then Krishna goes on to say that all beings, they're unmanifest before they were born. They're manifest after they're born, and they'll be unmanifest again after they die. Uh, the body will be unmanifest because it hasn't uh, started to... Uh, um, well, it's had nine months' worth of preparation, actually, when birth happens. And then uh, it manifests and grows further and finally lives a life and then dies and it becomes unmanifest again. So uh, in the last part of this, the soul is amazing. That's one of the things that uh, in uh, 229 we find that the soul is very amazing. Uh, but many people, even though the soul is very amazing, many people can't understand how the soul exists because they're materialists. They don't believe in the soul. They can't believe that there's something that goes on. And they don't want to think that there is a afterlife or a God or any kind of judgment for what they've done. So therefore, they can't grasp or perceive the soul in any kind of way, shape, or form. And Krishna winds up this section with saying, the dweller within the body cannot be slain. So this is what we went through last three weeks. So this was section, subsection 2, the not this body subsection. So that had 30 verses, and it took three weeks to go through that because we went through about uh, seven verses on an average every, every time, you know. And then uh, we finally finished that up last week. So that's a recap. I wanted just to kind of see that as a whole section in itself. We couldn't. Uh, it was too big to do in one setting, so I had to break it up into three pieces. But we're in sec subsection three today, which is the next subsection, but that one's shorter, and we are going to be able to do this one in one gulp. We'll just do this this week, and then we'll move on to subsection four next week. So uh, this is verses 231 to 38, and this is what I'm calling... Um, Krishna's social arguments. So here's how Krishna plays it out. This is verse 35. So, um, wait a minute, something's wrong there, but at any rate, I'll have to fix it some other way. Um, uh, Is it to, did I miss, did I put these backwards? Is that what happened? No. Yeah, somehow or another I skipped over. I skipped over to, that's what where my problem was, because it's supposed to be 31 through 38, so I wondered where 31 was. So now we're starting with 31, that's 231. Considering your specific duty as a kshatri, you should know that there's no better engagement for you than fighting on religious principles. And so there is no need for hesitation. Um, Prabhupada and Burijan both kind of make the point here that up to now, Krishna has been speaking uh, from scripture. He's been using very uh, philosophical reasoning. But now he's switching his focus. He's going to speak from a sociological and from a 
dharmic or a karmic perspective that Arjuna, you know, is a devotee, but beyond that, he's a kshatri, he's a fighter, he's a warrior. So this is what warriors do. They fight. They don't desire or uh, decide to um, uh, reject an opportunity for battle. That's not what kshatriyas do. So he's reminding Arjuna that this is his role in society. This is what he's supposed to do. <clears throat> and this is the way that the scriptures have always described kshatri. So considering your specific duty as a kshatri, you should know that there's no better engagement for you than fighting on religious principles. So there's no need for hesitation. So again, we're hearing about religious principles, but this is not a philosophical argument. This is a argument from Arjuna's role as a kshatri. It's a occupational argument. So 32, O Partha, happy are the kshatriyas to whom such fighting opportunities come unsought, opening for them the doors to the heavenly planets. So this is what kshatriyas actually appreciate. They want to engage in opportunities to fight because that's what their life is all about. You know, just as a baker bakes, just as a doctor does medicine, you know, uh, or a agricultural farmer, he grows crops. This is what kshatriyas do. They fight. And in the Vedas, we come to learn that a soldier in a battle, if the soldier dies in a battle, he's immediately promoted to heaven. It doesn't matter what side he's on or uh, any sins he might have committed in the past. Because he dies on a battlefield, automatic promotion to heaven. So that's the nature of the Vedic explanation of the process of being a kshatriya. Now, 33, if, however, you do not perform your religious duty of fighting, then you will certainly incur sins for neglecting your duties and thus lose your reputation as a fighter. Now, up to this point, Arjuna had all these fancy arguments for why he shouldn't fight, and he thought that killing superiors was sinful, killing his relatives was sinful, that uh, because all that was at stake was uh, their having the kingdom. He felt that was a material motivation. So he was thinking that if he fought, he would be a sinful man. But actually, Krishna is saying quite the opposite, that not if you uh, fight, you'll be sinful. If you don't fight, you'll be sinful. That's what Krishna is explaining here, that you have a duty, you're a kshatriya, the battle is here, and not only will you incur sin for not fighting because you're, you have a duty and you're not doing your duty, uh, but you will lose your reputation. And we hear a lot that Arjuna has quite a high reputation, you know, in fact. Uh, it's in the, better, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In Mahabharata, it explains that, you know, Arjuna was like, you know, the rock star of that time. You know, he was, uh, all the people knew who he was, and uh, uh, kids growing up would uh, pretend to be Arjuna and things like that. You know, it was, uh, it was he was, you know, very uh, highly esteemed by not only people on the earth, but also in the heavenly planets, because at one point he goes to the heavenly planets. Um, he's a son of us. And, of right, and God. he's got a reputation there too. Okay, so um, this is what um, Krishna is uh, explaining. So now he's explained, according to your occupation, you have a duty. If you don't do your duty, then you will be sinful. But now he's shifting. Now Krishna is speaking about Arjuna as having a reputation to uphold. Not, he's not talking duty now. So now we're talking about uh, how Arjuna will uh, lose his reputation. So it ends uh, in 33 at the very end. You will certainly incur sins and lose your reputation as a fighter. Now, from this point on, we're going to see Krishna really make a uh, bunch of presentations on this point. Uh, 
People will only speak of your infamy, and for a respectable person, dishonor is worse than death. So uh, Arjuna has a high reputation if he decides not to fight. People are not going to think very uh, highly of him. Uh, first of all, he's, um, excuse me, he's um, failed to perform his duty when it was obvious that he had a duty. And secondly, most people will think that he was afraid, which is what Krishna is going to hammer home here in the next few verses. So this is 35. The great generals who have highly esteemed your name and fame will think that you have left the battlefield out of fear only, thus they will consider you insignificant. So um, Arjuna not only has his own uh, fame and name to consider, he is a part of a family, he'll disgrace his family, and he has a reputation among peers, among other generals who are very gifted in fighting. So if he leaves the battlefield, they will not think, oh, we understand why Arjuna left the battle. He was compassionate. They will think, uh, that Arjuna, he used to be a very powerful warrior, but somehow or another, he became fearful in this battle of Kurukshetra. That's how they'll think. And this is what Krishna is presenting to Arjuna. The great generals who have highly esteemed your name and fame will think that you have left the battlefield out of fear only. Thus, they will consider you insignificant. And now that's his peers. Now his enemies will be even harder on him than this. So your enemies will describe you in many unkind words, scorn your ability. What could be more painful for you? O oh, son of Kunti, either you will be killed on the battlefield and attain the heavenly planets, or you will conquer and enjoy the earthly kingdom. Therefore, get up with determination and fight. So this is what uh, the <clears throat> two directions that Krishna is explaining to Arjuna. He's not telling Arjuna he's necessarily going to live through the battle and that he will be victorious. He's just telling him this is what could happen. Of course, Krishna knows what's going to happen, but uh, Arjuna is uh, not able to know. So he says, either you will die on the battle in that way, if you die in the battle, you will go to the heavenly worlds, which is a good thing. And if you win and you defeat your enemies and you live, then you will enjoy the earthly kingdom. So what's the problem there? So that's how Krishna is presenting it. These are the two things that could happen. And now finally in 38, Krishna kind of explains the mood with which Arjuna should fight. Do thou fight for the sake of fighting without considering happiness, distress, loss or gain, victory of defeat, and by so doing you shall never incur sin. And this is a, a mentality or a, an attitude that is very much explained in the Vedic literatures, that uh, this attitude means that we have a duty. If you're a brahmana, you have a duty to perform sacrifices and do various things, learn and teach, etc., etc. And those are the activities of a brahmana. If you're a kshatra, you have a different set of activities. You rule, you administer, you fight if necessary, and you keep order. And uh, if you're a Vaisha, you have to provide material substance for the people of the world. You have to provide their food, you have to provide their clothing, their other basic necessities. So Vaishas, they sell and they grow crops and they bank and they do all these kinds of things that uh, are uh, providing those needs for society. So in that way, they help. And Shudras, they fill in whatever else needs to be done on whatever other level. So the Vedic system from the Varnashram perspective is that according to your occupation, you have a duty. And if you perform that duty, uh, you may be successful. You may not be successful. You may be greatly admired. You may not be greatly admired. You may be understood. You may be misunderstood. Um, and whatever the case, you have a duty, and if you just do that duty, 
uh, then you are actually in fact successful, whether other people recognize it or not, because that's the, uh, that's the outlook. So we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. But this is the, uh, you know, uh, eight verses here that uh, were part of this, uh, what I call the uh, um, Krishna social argument. So he's using a social argument, he's using an occupational argument, and in this way he is explaining to Arjuna what his real best interest is and why he should fight. And he's turning upside down Arjuna's presentation of the battle being sinful. He's turning it on its head, saying that if you don't fight the battle, it'll be sinful. Okay. So, if we look at the purports of these verses from 31 to 38, we find this kind of basic points in Prabhupada's purports, you know. Uh, he, Prabhupada talks about two types of varnashram dharma. And, you know, he's talking about uh, there is an eternal duty, which he calls sanatan dharma. And then there is an occupational duty. Prabhupada doesn't use the word there, but usually we call this jati dharma. So, occupational. Yeah, right, right. So, uh, varnashram dharma is overlaid by two layers, you know. So, one aspect of Varnashram Dharm is the occupational part, where everyone in society has one of these roles. There are Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, or Shudra. And it doesn't matter whether anybody knows it or whether anybody classifies them or whether anybody's been trained for them. Still, people will naturally fall into these four categories of occupational duty. Uh, however, if they're not trained, if it's not organized, it'll be chaos. And instead of having a, a cooperative and a, um, a harmonious society, we'll have the kind of society we have now, which is where there's class struggle at every side, at every turn. So this particular uh, occupational duty that we have is usually called jati dharm. But sanatana dharm is the occupation we have as a human being to come to terms with who we really are as servants of God. That's what Sanatna Dharma is. And so in other places, Prabhupada says, usually the two kind of go in the same direction, but there can be times where one kind of Dharma is asking you to move in one direction, the other kind of Dharma is asking you to go in the other direction. So in such cases, you should always follow Sanatna Dharma rather than Jati Dharma. Because if one solves and um, perfectly um, executes all his occupational duties, but he does not make any effort to understand who he is and how to connect with God. His life is useless. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he won't have incurred any kind of uh, bad karma from the occupational Vedic point of view, but he will have missed the point of life. However, if someone actually manages to become a, a devotee and understand his position as a servant of God and help others to do that, such a person is automatically uh, fulfilled all these other lower Vedic uh, necessities. So one doesn't have to worry about them. Devarshi Bhutaptra Ninam Petrinam Kinkaro Nayamrini Charajan Sarvat Manoyam Saranam Saranam Gato Mukunda Parhit Yakartam. So, um, one who follows the path of worshiping Mukunda, the giver of liberation, owes no duties or to any of these lower kinds of dharma. So Prabhupada explains that a little bit. And of course, Prabhupada also explains the word kshatriya, which comes from two roots. Kshat, which means to hurt, and triate, which means to deliver. So a kshatriya delivers one from being hurt or harmed by others. So Kshatriyate or Kshatriya, that's how that compound is formed. And so, ironically, a Kshatriya keeps one kind of person from being harmed by harming another kind of person. So, people who are innocent 
are kept from being harmed by people who are perpetrators. And the perpetrators, if necessary, have to be harmed to stop them from what they're doing. So that's the nature of a kshatriya. And of course, we've been talking about how uh, Krishna is reversing Arjuna's argument, his uh, uh, proposition that fighting would be sinful. Krishna is saying, no, actually not fighting is sinful. Arjuna would win if he lived or died. We just talked about that. And uh, loss of reputation for Arjuna. So, um, for a kshatriya, they live based on their reputation. You know, for people who are administrators or kings or leaders or soldiers, such people have really no property really more important than their reputation. So in one sense, the reputation means that they have um, tried to live up to the duties and obligations imposed on them by their occupation. They've done that as uh, uh, painstakingly as possible. Maybe they were successful, maybe they weren't, but in any case, they did that. And if a kshatriya gave his word, uh, he had to fulfill his word. There was no such thing as wel- welching or, or reneging. No, right. So whatever a kshatriya claimed he would do, he would do. You know, quite different from modern politicians, uh, which just make promises for the sake of uh, votes and then conveniently forget all those promises, uh, you know, the day after election. So, um, this is the nature of a kshatriya. So reputation is very important, not necessarily because they're egomaniacs, but because they're uh, kshatriyas, they put themselves on the line for um, preserving justice, for uh, creating and fostering order in society. So that's where uh, reputation is a serious problem if it becomes damaged as a result of some inappropriate action or some failure to act. So as we said that from many people's uh, point of view, Arjuna's version of compassion would not be thought of as compassionate. It would be thought of as a pretext actually for the fact that he was fearful of the battle. So for someone who has been honored as much as Arjuna, to then again be disrespected would be worse than death. So um, at the end of this section, Krishna is making one thing very clear, and that is that Krishna himself wants the battle. And so after all is said and done, after all uh, arguments are um, examined and um, uh, stratified into their relative level of importance. The most important thing is that the Supreme Lord wants the battle. It was all orchestrated by, by Krishna. It was all orchestrated right, by Krishna right. for everything, and Arjuna right. just has to just right, right. go so, and do that. So Krishna has designed the battle to take place. Um, and he, he'll tell Arjuna all in the Bhagavad Gita later that I've already killed these soldiers. It's, if you don't do it, someone else will. You know, so uh, that's the, the point, that uh, this was already uh, a plan that Krishna was uh, doing. And this plan had existed already for many, many years. So that's <coughs> Prabhupada's purports. And then from Burijan's uh, purports on this same section, um, he also brings us around to the same idea that previously in the section we talked of as the not the body section, the uh, 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 21 to 30 section, in in, uh, uh, 10 to 30 section that we just finished, that Krishna had used these jnana or very scriptural philosophical arguments. Now he's using uh, more down-to-earth arguments. So uh, he's uh, explaining, um, and uh, Prabhupada also explains this, that uh, why are you worried about killing your relatives, Arjuna? This is what Krishna is saying. Because if you kill Bhishma and Drona, they'll get new bodies. And because they died on a battlefield, they'll go straight to heaven. So where's the problem? 
you know, that's uh, the idea that Krishna is giving him. And uh, so we could ask the question why Arjuna should be motivated by honor and dishonor. And uh, I've already kind of covered that, but what I wanted to say again was that he wasn't honored in the same sense that he was egotistically wanting his, his uh, name to be glorified, but he wanted to be known as someone who did what he could to live up to his obligations as a uh, kshatriya. And uh, so Arjuna's compassion is considered non-Aryan by Krishna. So an Aryan is not a race, it's not a ethnic group. An Aryan is anyone who reads and tries to implement the standards of Vedic literature. That's what an Aryan is. Yeah. So uh, um, people have lots of misconceptions on that. And so Arjuna is being considered non-Aryan for his so-called wrongly conceived compassion. So, um, so again, we're, when we talk about this, no fault for those who perform duty with detachment. But what I wanted to point out here is this number seven, Nishkama Karma Yoga. Burijan says there's two levels of Nishkama Karma. That what this means, um, Ka kama means material desire, kama. Karma means work or it means reaction to work. And nish, the prefix, is a negator. So uh, nish kama means without desire, karma. So working without desire. So this compound uh, usage here, nish kama karma yoga, uh, has two levels, and Burijan points them out as the level where a person knows they're not the body and they're performing their duty very um, um, piously, understanding what their duty is and performing it. That's one level of nishkama karma. So their duty might cause them to do things that are not beneficial to them as individuals. This is what sometimes happens. When a person performs duties, sometimes that duty runs contrary to one's personal self-interest, you know, uh, like a political leader, you know, might think, you know, well, if I go into battle, maybe I'll be killed, so I'll send other soldiers there. So uh, that's shirking your duty for a personal interest. And this is the same for any of the four uh, varnas that we have duties to perform. And sometimes in the performance of the duty, one has to do things which are very much against one's own personal self-interest. But because you have a duty which is not based on your self-interest, it's based on religion and based on a interest of the whole, you may have to put yourself at risk or put yourself in a bad situation. You may be actually chastised or looked down upon for having performed your duty. So if someone does that and is equal, whether people are blaming them or praising them, whether they're successful or not, then that's nishkama karma. But there's a higher version where one is trying to serve the Supreme Lord. If one tries to serve the Supreme Lord, then that's even higher than this other kind of nishkama karma because then one is pleasing Krishna directly and in that way one is fulfilling his most important duty. One is rising above jati dharma and fulfilling his sanatana dharma. So uh, this is the two levels here. So. Any question about that? No, I said... Use the microphone, please. No, I'm just... Oh, you're thinking, okay. Yeah. Okay, so... Here is, you know, a few things that are said in this uh, section about kshatriya's duties. A kshatriya, we mentioned that the two words kshatriya, they're a uh, compound, they protect a person from harm, a kshatriya protects someone from being harmed. And they're not meant to be nonviolent. Nonviolent is not for kshatriyas. It's, uh, uh, that's, you know, like a, um, 
a, a, a baker having a problem with being in a hot kitchen or a um, you know a doctor uh, having a problem with uh, seeing blood you know it's it's the nature of their work they they can't reject it and Prabhupada uses the example of Jaipur Kshatriyas who uh, they're um, sort of um, rite of passage for becoming Kshatriyas they have to go out and kill a tiger with just their sword you know and uh, if they can if they aren't killed in the process, then they're considered a genuine Kshatriya. <laughs> so, um, at least that was the tradition. I don't think they do this anymore, but that was uh, the original tradition. So, um, nonviolence is non Aryan. We talked about that. And uh, again, we have this um, overall theme that Kshatriyas, if they're fighting for the right cause or the wrong cause, they didn't create the cause, they're just instruments in the uh, process of uh, uh, battling, so they are automatically admitted into heaven, so uh, they gain the heavenly planet, so we hear that in this section a number of places. Um, This next section I'm going to go over pretty quickly here, but I think it's important. I'll come back to this at another time. That... um, I didn't understand this when I was first trying to understand Bhagavad Gita, and it caused me a lot of confusion. And so I point this out to people. Uh, And uh, I don't know of many other devotees who make this this particular uh, point, but I make it because I think it's an important point. So sometimes we see words, like in this case, karma yoga. And we're going to see karma yoga in chapter 3, and we're going to see it in a lot of other places where karma yoga, the word, is used. And there's a tendency to think that all these Sanskrit words are technical terms, and like, you know, mathematics or like uh, medicine, they have a specific application, and they never are used in different ways. But unfortunately, that's not true. Uh, And um, there's always the need to understand the context. And um, if we don't read and understand context, we can come away with a completely wrong understanding. And so this is the point that I'm making here, that the words karma yoga can mean one of three very related but different things. You know, that uh, one concept for karma yoga is that it is identical to bhakti yoga. And in this part of Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 2 and in chapter 3 for the most part, the words karma yoga are just another way of saying bhakti yoga. In other words, there's no difference between the two. And we can break that down. And the reason Krishna is using the word karma yoga and Prabhupada is using the word karma yoga is uh, Arjuna is talking about not fighting. So Arjuna is talking about some stationary kind of yoga where there's no action. And so this idea of no one should act is the essence of bhakti. Bhakti is not a stationary kind of yoga. Bhakti is not a um, some kind of um, ethereal platform where one is removed from bodily action altogether. Rather, bhakti yoga is an active, very transitive kind of yoga. So uh, that's why the word karma is yoga, being used there, karma yoga. However, in other places in Bhagavad Gita, it could also mean karma mishra bhakti or straight out karma kanda. So karma kanda is the idea of performing work for material benediction based on the Vedas, which is a very different thing from bhakti yoga. And uh, you know, later on we'll bring in the idea of the yoga ladder and we'll talk about how these different yogas are 
uh, echelon, how one is higher than the other and the reasons one is higher than the other. But uh, karma kanda is not at all uh, the real uh, important thing in the Vedic literature. In fact, it's looked down on, karma kanda. It's a lower kind of realization because a person is not interested in God. A person is trying to please their material desires through the agency of following Vedic prescriptions, which is better than doing it just by figuring out how you're going to lie, cheat, steal, and, and otherwise get what you want. But at the same time, it's certainly not devotion. So sometimes when you read the word karma yoga in Bhagavad Gita, it will not mean bhakti yoga. It will instead mean this karma kanda, working for material desire and not having any concept of God. Now, in between those two, there's something called Karma Mishra Bhakti Yoga. And that's what most of us actually do. Mishra means to mix. So we are mixing karma with bhakti, which means that we understand bhakti is the highest thing, but because we are still addicted, we have so many uh, habits that come from our days where we wanted material benefit, you know, that we can't just give them up all at once. We're trying to get rid of them, but at the same time, we do have some vested interest in our performing bhakti yoga, which is gradually being purified out. And that process is called karma mishra bhakti. And so in some contexts, uh, karma yoga means that. So um, one has to understand which context we're actually uh, thinking of. And then, you know, I, I could get into this more, but I'm not going to uh, just be aware that this is there. And if someone's interested, this next um, uh, slide here, this is where I have my, you know, uh, references, where if you're interested, you can stop the video and, you know, take a photo of that. And you can see my arguments and where in Bhagavad Gita um, karma yoga is used as a uh, synonym for bhakti yoga, where it's used as a cinnamon, synonym for karma mishra bhakti, and where uh, karma yoga is being used as a synonym for straight out karma or karma kanda. So um, it's, I think, important to know that. Uh, there are other words that are nicely also um, sort of uh, a swamp for misunderstanding uh, karma yoga. And another an interesting word is varnashram dharma itself, you know. And the word jnana itself has two very different meanings that need to be sometimes you have to focus to see which version of jnana we're actually talking about. But again, that's kind of uh, beyond the scope of today's overview. So I'm going to leave it at that point, and uh, we will come back to it a little bit later on. And now, here we're wrapping up today. This is section three. In the, in the beginning, we started with wrapping up section subsection two, which was, you know, the not the body section. Now we're recapping subsection three, which is Arjuna's social arguments, which is, I mean, Krishna's social arguments, 31 to 38. Krishna tells Arjuna there's no better duty than fighting. Kshatriyas are happy to get opportunities to fight. If Arjuna does not fight, he will get sin. We just read that. And Arjuna will be disrespected, which will be worse than death for him. Great generals will think he failed to fight out of fear. Arjuna's enemies will scorn his abilities. Either Arjuna will get heaven or a kingdom, uh, so he should go ahead and fight. One of those two things is going to happen. Fighting for the sake of fighting. So uh, this is the right attitude, to fight for the sake of fighting, which means we are not concerned for happiness, distress, loss, or gain, victory, or defeat. So that was today's uh, subsection, subsection 3, which went from 2.31 to 2.38. So that's today's section. And um, 
That brings us to the end, exec, except for I'll talk about next week. Any questions about? No, you know, it's. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, again, this is what we will be doing. Next week will be June 21st, and we will. This was uh, part five today of chapter two. We'll be doing part six, and we'll launch into the booty yoga section, which is starting from 39. It goes all the way to 53, but that's too long, so we'll break it into three pieces: six, seven, and eight. Those will be all booty yoga section, and. Uh, um, that section next week will be session 30, and we will talk about booty yoga, karma yoga. We'll go back to the flow of the dialogue of how the dialogue uh, works itself out in chapter two. And we'll talk a little bit about creation and the no loss philosophy. And uh, we will also talk a little bit about focus and determination. Niverti Marg and Pravrti Marg, which we don't find the words used in Bhagavad Gita, but it is used in Srimad Bhagavatam, but it's an important concept. We'll be uh, discussing that next week. Okay. Thank you. All right. So uh, thank you all very much for your kind attention. All glories to Srimad Bhagavad Gita, all glories to the Vaishnava devotees. Hare Krishna.